Longing for heaven to come down to earth, and we seek to be a people who live out of the overflow of Christ in our life, and our Sunday morning worship services are to help to cultivate that, as well as our midweek small groups and all the other things that we're up to, and we'll talk about that later. In Exodus 20, 24, God promises to the people of Israel, wherever I cause my name to be honored, I will come and bless you. We seek to be a place and a people where God's name is honored, where we call upon the name of the Lord, and where God is, is present and worshiped, and things are changed and transformed. Amen? Amen. So each week, we light this candle to signify the presence of Christ's Spirit among us, to signify that God is alive and active among us. Amen. I heard that amen. I receive that amen. So Lord Jesus, we pray that you would be alive and active and powerful among us. Help us to be a people that call upon your name so that we might be saved, so your blessing might flow in and among us. In your powerful name we pray. And all the people said, amen. Good morning. Please stand with me for the reading of the song My heart, oh God, is steadfast. My heart is steadfast. I will sing and make music. Awake, my soul. Awake, heart and lyre. I will awaken the dawn. I will praise you, Lord, among the nations. I will sing to you among the peoples. For great is your love reaching to the heavens. Your faithfulness reaches to the skies. Be exalted, O God, above the heavens. Let your glory be over all the earth. Praise is rising. Eyes are turning to you. We turn to you. Hope is stirring. Hearts are yearning for you. We long for you. When we see you, we find strength.
depths of your mercy that saved a wretch like me and the waves of forgiveness your blood covers me for it I the weight oh the weight of your glory that brings me to my knees and the power of your presence that heals and sets me free for
by his death, Jesus has destroyed every barrier and dividing wall of hostility, making peace for us with God and one another. So let us take a few minutes, turn around, and share that peace this morning.
morning again. Welcome. We're all talking so much that I even got carried away talking with people, and someone came up to me and gave me the announcements, like kind of so. We love being a friendly church, amen? So there's a lot going on, so I'm going to try to make this quick. Is Our food pantry is coming up in a couple weeks, and this is one of those um, kind of weird months where the supplier where we usually get food from there's like a gap, and so we're actually collecting non-perishable food so that we can have everything we need to give stuff away um, during our regular food pantry. So please bring, just think in your mind, if I only had $5 and I had to feed my family, what would I get that's non-perishable? Get that and then bring it. There's um, uh, grocery stuff outside, so you can place it there, and we'll be collecting that this week as well as next week. Next Saturday, so just a couple days from now, there's going to be a youth ski day and inner tubing. If you don't like skiing or snowboarding, there's going to be inner tubing option up at Cannonsburg, and then we're going through, through to the Ruzikis afterwards to hang out. So I've been sending emails out to the families, but please, if you were like, what? I didn't even know about that. Come talk to me right after the service. So youth ski day this Friday, or this Saturday, February 1st. Also, right before that, is uh, the January 31st Fire by Night worship and prayer time. And this is really going to be kind of the, thank you for the, the cheers that I heard. Uh, this is really going to be kind of like gathering up our month of fast forward where we as a congregation have been fasting and praying for what is God inviting us into this next year. And so we've been going through a process. Many of you have been doing that in your small groups and other groups. And so please come on this Friday at 7 to 9 o'clock, there will be child care available, so don't let that be a hurdle. I know sometimes maybe you're like, oh, Fridays, it's like, uh, you know, there's a lot going on. So please make this fire by night. I mean, you don't have to come to every fire by night forever if you come to this one. But please come to this one and let's worship and pray and just hear what God is doing amongst us. So again, that's this Friday at 7 p.m. with what? What's going to be available? Child care. Amen. All right, we're going to do a fun thing with uh, John and Todd. John Jameson and Todd Bradford are going to kind of, um, I'm not sure exactly what they're going to do. So here you go. <laughs> you might want to keep a hand on it. Yeah, you'll see if that's wise. Morning, everybody. I'm Todd. And I'm John. And Todd and I are friends, and, but we're very different from each other. You see, John uh, is a college professor. He's got a doctorate, and uh, he spent the last 30-plus uh, years in the world of academia. His, uh, his kids are all grown and married and long since out of the house. Right. And Todd, on the other hand, has a daughter still in college, and He's got a man management job right now, but uh, we call his background probably more blue collar. And um, so it's been actually several years now that, ago that uh, my wife Linda and I invited Todd and Robin, his, Todd's wife Robin, to our small group at our house. And we went, and uh, over the course of time, John and I became very good friends. Uh, we found that we had uh, a lot in common together. Right. <laughs> we, we, we both, uh, we like motorcycles. Right. And uh, I'm, I'm, a, I'm kind of a do-it-yourselfer, and so Todd was kind of impressed by the fact that I could do anything being an academic. And... <laughs> watch it. And, uh, right. And so we just have a, we have a lot of thing, different things in common. I, I, for instance, I know how to weld. And I often need things welded. <laughs> so, that, you know, it works out pretty well for me. So that, you know, we've grown to, to just have a good friendship, too. We've supported each other during some hard times. We pray for each other. Uh, once in a while, we give each other a shove to get back in the right direction. Yeah, well, which isn't that easy for me. I mean, I look how big he is. <laughs> so... All that said, um, I, I really sh probably shouldn't bring this up uh, in church, but, you know, we went over to Todd and Robbins a while back. Do you realize they have cats? And, 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 
and I don't mean one cat, I mean several cats. And Todd and Robin, I, I guess they actually, they like cats. Well, now hold on a minute here. You, I, you, I was shocked when we were over there at, for Bible study and at the end, they open up the basement door and out bounds this big smelly dog. I mean, well, I like, we've had dogs in the past, we just choose not to right now, and we just feel cats are better. Cats are better? Are you kidding me? Cat, you know, dogs have masters, right? Cats have staff. <laughs> we train our dog. I think your cats are training you. Hey, I, I just can't handle that dog energy. It's, it's creepy. They're just in your face all the time. They're like, ah, yeah, I just chewed up your couch cushion. Take me for a walk. I, I just can't handle that. Dude, cats are absolutely the worst. I wouldn't have a dog if it picked up its own poop in the backyard. <laughs> hey, at least dogs know that they're supposed to poop outside. Not the ones we had. I have to tell you, I was very disappointed when you were over at our house. I handed John one of our kittens and he just held the thing like it had a disease or something. Everybody knows that cats carry infectious diseases. Have you never heard of cat scratch fever? That's fake news. Fake news. All right, well, listen, the, the, the dog and cat thing is actually kind of true, but you might have you guessed that that's really an allegory uh, for the fact that Todd and I also discovered over time that we are kind of on opposite sides of center when it comes to some political topics as well. The point is the fact that having different political views uh, does not change uh, the, fl uh, the friendship and the fact that at the base of it all we're brothers in Christ. And, and we've discussed at some length our political views with each other, uh, even to the point where we brought it to our small group and one night we discussed politics, believe it or not, and, and how to deal with the fact that people have different views than us and, and how we can love people and have a relationship and a friendship with them uh, during, despite what differing views that we might have. Right. And, you know, we've just come to the conclusion that's something that Jesus has called us to, and we, we really can't tolerate a small group where we can't talk about things that matter. Absolutely. And the upcoming small group uh, push that we're going to have is love over fear, and it's intended to help us find a way to love and respect people that we find hard to believe that they view things differently than us. Um, living and understanding of love and grace. I mean, seeing past someone's belief uh, to the person that they are in Christ. And, and that's, that's really the, the most important thing that we can have. All right. Now, Great. about the fact that you still love the Beatles, though. Wait, 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 what? You don't? No. Whoa, this, right, this could be the so straw much. that broke the camel's back. <laughs> Thank you so much, yeah. So hopefully you can see that it is possible to be friends with people who have different viewpoints. And that is one of the things that we're really trying to move into. And um, I'm just going to read a quote from, we're going to be doing some material from a guy named Dan White Jr. You do not have to buy a book for this small group. Um, you can just come and be part of the conversation. Um, but from the introduction of, of the small group study, he's, he writes this, it's never been clearer that we need love to heal us. Divisions abound, and fear saturates many of our relationships. One in six Americans no longer talk to a close friend or family member because of the 2016 election. I don't know if you've ever come, like, and we're not, this is not just politics, by the way. Um, we see it all over the place. We see it, we are very quick to decide who is with us and who is like us and who is not and who needs to be avoided or we just don't talk about things. And I think Christ calls us to something higher, something better, something deeper. And um, again, from Dan White, if healing is going to come, it's going to come through the people of God in the way of Jesus. The world does not have the inner resources of the Holy Spirit to resist the outrage addiction. 
Human nature feasts on the desire to believe that we are completely right and that the other side is made up of monsters. Yet the church can pioneer another way, the way of love in Jesus. And so as we endeavor to join in these small groups in the coming, in the coming weeks, we're going to do this study up through Easter. And we want to really seek to be, when we, when we greet each other on Sunday mornings, we say there is no division in the body of Christ. We say that, but do we live that? Do we truly believe that? And are we really willing to reach out to people who we know are really different from us and who have very different opinions and viewpoints about things? And so that's the call to us as a church in these coming weeks, is are we willing to follow the way of Jesus and to really seek to love people who are different from us? When Jesus called his disciples together, they were radically different people who had radically different viewpoints. Um, if you ever look, I mean, and that'll, that'll come up as one of our conversations. But Jesus called together his disciples, and those 12 guys probably did not want to be in the same room with each other. But Jesus was doing something. He was showing the world that there is a better way. There is a way to move forward in unity and in love, and that it is the love of God that can unify us, and we can all sit at the same table and eat together. So that's what we want to just really challenge you as you sign up for a small group to maybe go out of your way to join a group of people that maybe you don't know as well or maybe you know are really different from you um, and to just say, what does God have for me in learning how to love people that are different from me? So uh, signups are available on the table in the foyer. They're also available online, so you can find the sign-up link on the Facebook page. You can find it in the weekly emails that Aaron sends out. Um, if you're not on that email and you would like to be, there's connect cards on the back of the seat um, in front of you, so you can sign up to get onto that email list as well. Um, and also, uh, we just really would love for you to join us um, in, this, in these groups for the next several weeks. So... And then we also forgot to take the offering earlier, so if I could invite the offering hosts to come, and we'll take the offering as we read from Galatians. So would you stand as we read Galatians 5 and parts of 6? You, my brothers and sisters, were called to be free, but do not use your freedom to indulge the flesh. Rather, serve one another humbly in love. For the entire law is fulfilled in keeping this one command, love your neighbor as yourself. If you bite and devour each other, watch out, or you will be destroyed by each other. Brothers and sisters, if someone is caught in a sin, you who live by the Spirit should restore that person gently. But watch yourselves, or you also may be tempted. Carry each other's burdens, and in this way, you will fulfill the law of Christ. If anyone thinks they are something when they are not, they deceive themselves. Each one should test their own actions. Then they can take pride in themselves alone without comparing themselves to someone else, for each one should carry their own load. Nevertheless, the one who receives instruction in the word should share all good things with their instructor. Do not be deceived. God cannot be mocked. A man reaps what he sows. Whoever sows to please their flesh from the flesh will reap destruction. Whoever sows to please the spirit from the spirit will reap eternal life. Let us not become weary in doing good. For at the proper time, we will reap a harvest if we do not give up. Therefore, as we have opportunity, let us do good to all people, especially to those who belong to the family of believers. This is the word of the Lord. You may be seated. Well, good morning. You know, if I can be honest... Um, I've not always liked those bits of the Bible as much. Uh, Paul's practical instructions for living. Uh, practical stru in instructions for living life together in the church. I've never really liked those parts of the Bible. Um, I really, personally, I, I prefer the miracle stories. You know, the grand, fantastic stories of healings and action and intrigue. And, you know, Jesus against the Pharisees and 
Jesus with a woman at the well, you know, you know just the, the ordinary radical. And, or, you know, in, in Galatians, it starts out with this, you know, Paul relaying the story of, you know, him just opposing the apostle Peter to his face and calling him out on hypocrisy. And I, I love those moments in the Bible. But I don't know if you've noticed, you get to the end of almost all of Paul's letters, and they're, they're all kind of the same. He switches gears into just practical instructions for like, like the mundane just grind of life, you know, do good to people and practice hospitality and, you know, carry each other's burdens and just, just ordinary, mundane, boring stuff like getting along and avoiding temptation and supporting one another and being generous and dealing with pride, you know, just ordinary, mundane stuff, nothing to see here. That's been my general feeling over the years reading Paul's letters. I love the moments of action. And when it comes to the Bible, when it comes to life, I prefer the extraordinary. And one of the things I've been realizing lately is I've actually been raised and shaped and formed to love the extraordinary. Uh, And maybe some of you can relate. You know, I I, I was raised in an era that, uh, you know, we told kids, you're special. You're unique. You can grow up to be Anything you want to be. Anyone raised like that? I mean, you can be any. The sky is the limit. Now, what you may not have known is that telling kids that sort of thing is, is actually, it's kind of a, re, it's a relatively new phenomenon, an American phenomenon. It's, it's part of the self-esteem movement, which, uh, you know, is a kind of a grand social experiment in trying to solve the world's problems by you know, giving kids participation trophies and that sort of thing, and telling people to feel good about yourself. And, and uh, you know, it's, it's come into question in recent years whether that's done anyone any good. Um, and yet, it seems to me that the, uh, the, the, the quest to try to feel good is, has taken a more difficult turn in, in my kids' generation, uh, you know, with social media. And my kids, um, my kids are are wondering why they can't, you know, be like the eight-year-old uh, kid that's earning $20 million a year opening toys on YouTube. I mean, they're, 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 they've come to think that, you know, that's the be anything you want to be. This idea, though, that you were, you were born to be special, you're, you're born to be extraordinary, it goes way back in the American psyche. I mean, it, it, Americans have always been enamored by the pioneer spirits. You know, you can set out for the Wild West and make something of yourself. Now, I, I don't know if you've noticed, but that, that's a lot of pressure. That's a lot of pressure. And I'm probably ranting now, aren't I? Um, you know, it's, it's an American thing. I, I don't want to rant about this. I, let me, I, I want to talk about something a little more personal today. Um, uh, actually, very personal for me. Um, and... and you know, it began just a few years ago um, when I started noticing that more and more of my friends uh, were just sort of falling off the deep end. You know, we're not becoming all they could be, but we're, we're instead just blowing up their lives and throwing away, you know, a decent marriage and just sort of self-destructing. And some of them were people I just never expected. Um, and I, I hope you haven't had that experience uh, with uh, with friends or family, but I, I know some of you have because some of you actually said to me, well, Mike, it, it seems like a lot of people I know, you know, even inside the church are, are just sort of self-destructing, particularly in the area of marriage. I mean, what's, what's with that? Is there something like in the water? Is it, is it contagious? Should I be concerned for my, my own marriage? And I, I've, I've uh, done a fair amount of just soul searching and you know, staring at the ceiling late at night as I lay in bed, wondering about this question, like, what is it, um, you know, that, that we see so many friends just, just toss their life in the fire and chase a fantasy? Because it's, you know, it's not just my friends. I mean, I, I can sense in myself a, a deep and kind of insidious propensity for self-destructive action. I mean, I realize in looking at friends and acquaintances that there, there, you know, there lives in me, too, a very quiet but ever-present just 
allure towards decisions that could destroy everything I love. And we, you know, we all have things inside of us. Given the right help and prodding and encouragement and nourishment could just drive us to do dark things, things we'd never planned to do. You know, for some of us, it's, you know, it's just deep sense of loneliness and uh, deep sense of, you know, no, identity uh, and, and lack of identity, uh, deep, deep heartache that we don't know how to describe. For some of us, you know, it's fears of not having enough. But for me, I, I want to give a name to this this morning because I, I think there's a, there's a bug that's bitten a lot of us, uh, you know, a, a virus, a uh, uh, a, a unique kind of darkness that's specific to the time we live in. And even the type of church we've, we've decided to go to. And I'm going to call it, at least for me, the lust for the extraordinary. The lust for the extraordinary. I, I, I think a lot of us feel it. It keeps us feeling dissatisfied in our work tormented, you know, that it's not, it's not fulfilling enough. Have I done the right thing? It, it keeps us thinking about endless possibilities and, you know, planning the next great escapade or, you know, writing the next great American novel or, you know, being a somebody instead of just being fully present with, you know, our kids or our neighbors or whomever is in front of us. It, it can have a scheming about, you know, the next big purchase, the next big vacation, instead of just enjoying what we have. And I think we can actually get addicted to the extraordinary. We can get addicted to the way it makes us feel. We can get addicted to being a big deal. My wife and I actually have a name for that. When we find ourselves taking each other too seriously, Lauren just looks at me and she says, stop trying to be such a big dill. <laughs> I'm like, yes, I will, I will snare. We started the conversation just kind of joking about, you know, little quirks in our marriage and, you know, funny little things between us. And, 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 and one of them was just the fact that I, I kind of have trouble settling for the ordinary thing. Um, you know, when I'm looking for a restaurant, my wife would tell you, I, I just always assume there's probably one better. Like, when we're in a new city, I'm like, if we, just, if we just walk like another few miles, there'd probably be a better option a little further. You know, I, I, I just have trouble settling for ordinary fun, like, you know, just sitting and watching a football game that I don't care about. And we, we joked with the counselor about how Lauren, you know, I said she just loves to like watch football and drink like cheap beer and listen to country music and just ordinary stuff. But I can't just sit and just chill out. Uh, and and the, the psychologist, he wasn't laughing. He, he looked at me and he said, well, of course, because you're a pastor's kid. <laughs> and at, you're a vineyard pastor's kid. And you've been bit by the bug. And I thought, what? I, he said, you know, I notice a lot of, a lot of uh, pastor's kids and missionary kids and particularly even just kids raised in vineyard churches. I'm around a lot of them. And, you know, it, they're just raised to believe they're supposed to be extraordinary and exceptional, different, radical, passionate you know, they're supposed to change the world, rock the nations, shape culture. I mean, they were just raised that way. And, you know, I found many of them just can't do normal things. They can't settle for ordinary Christianity, ordinary hobbies, ordinary restaurants. And I thought, whoa, this, this guy's got, he's got my number. And he's right. And I suspect he's not just right about me. Because many of us choose the Vineyard Church because we want to see the miracles, the greater things Jesus talked about. We don't want ordinary Christianity. We don't like mundane church services. And there's something good in that, I, I, I think. I, I think I think still. <laughs> because I'm afraid there's a dark side to that too. I, I'm afraid that I, I, 
that the charismatic church, churches like ours, has a bit of a lust for the extraordinary. And it's not all bad, for sure. I mean, Jesus told us to ask for greater things, to do greater works, to hunger and thirst, to be filled with the Holy Spirit, you know, to really pour out our hearts in extravagant worship. But there's a, there's a tinge of a, like the lust for the extraordinary, I've noticed in me. And along with that comes a disdain for the mundane. We don't love rituals. We don't love basics. We, don't, we, we like to do the stuff of Christianity as long as the stuff is miracles. We don't always like to do the boring stuff. You know, like just read a little scripture each day and pray and serve and get up again and do it the next day. Now, I'm, I may be exaggerating a little bit. I'm poking a little too hard. I mean, I, I, but I, I think some of you know what I'm talking about. We have a lust for the extraordinary. And the problem is that a lot of this book is ordinary. Ordinary instructions for living fairly mundane lives. Just showing up every day in life. I mean, you'd almost get the idea from the Proverbs. Or almost get the idea from the end of the start of this series that we've been calling Living Life on Purpose. This January series, we read the story of Jesus' baptism. And... Uh, you know, Jesus goes down to the baptism waters for a baptism for ordinary sinners, which is odd. And, you know, but as he comes out of the water, a voice comes from heaven, the spirit descends, and the voice says, this is my son in whom I'm well pleased. And the amazing thing is that Jesus hasn't even done anything amazing yet. I mean, he hasn't done any miracles he hasn't faced down the devil in the desert. He, he hasn't walked on water. He's just, best we know, he's been like making furniture with his hands for 20-odd years. I mean, you'd almost get the idea that God likes Jesus just because he does, not for what he does. Even, even while Jesus was just an ordinary guy. Now, of course, Jesus wasn't just an ordinary guy. He was an ordinary Jew, uh, at least in his day-to-day -day life, he was an ordinary Jew, and so he was raised with a rich and repetitious tradition of prayer and highly ritualized Jewish faith. A few years ago, we, we actually started trying out some old church traditions, some ritualized traditions, because uh, I really sensed that the Spirit was drawing us towards some, some dry, rote ritual, if the Spirit would, might do that sort of thing. And part of it was just realizing that ordinary rituals were part of the thing that deeply shaped Jesus' life. And, you know, we started reading scripture together each week like we do, following the lectionary of pre-selected passages. And I know a lot of you enjoyed it because we do like new stuff at the Vineyard. Uh, we like to try uh, novel things for sure. But then we came to the end of the liturgical year. I could see it coming on the calendar you know, East, or, you know, Advent and Epiphany and, and, and uh, you know, Easter, Holy Week, Pentecost. But then all that was left after Pentecost was what? Ordinary time. And I thought, vineyard folks are never going to go in for ordinary time. I mean, I think they'll do an Advent or Epiphany, but ordinary time? Who wants to be Ordinary. And I talked to my spiritual director about it this, this um, um, last week, and he's a, he's a retired Catholic priest, and so he's given his life to maintaining a tradition full of ordinary rituals, some of them very dull and unexciting. And I said, you know, I just feel nauseated with this idea of ordinary time. And he said, well, that's, that's funny, and not funny, because the word ordinary comes from Latin, ordinarius. And in Catholic spirituality, it just refers to a well-ordered life, following what God has ordained. You know, it, a definition of ordinary Christianity, say, it's just simple obedience to what God has ordained in life. You know, showing up to church, showing up to work, hugging your kids, kissing your wife, rinse, repeat, just day by day, step by step. Ordinary obedience to the way God has designed life 
And, you know, most of life, he said, just comes down to just putting one foot in front of the other. Left foot, right foot, left foot for a lifetime. And I said, well, that doesn't really sound very inspiring to me. And I, I, don't, I don't want an ordinary life. You know, I, I said, I, I, I want to do grand things for God. You know, I, I want to bring heaven to earth. I want to see the greater miracles Jesus promised. I want to change the world. I want to do stuff like Jesus. And then I remembered most of what Jesus did was pretty ordinary, except for those last few years. And most of what he did was very ordinary. And today I want to suggest to you that the most important step a lot of us could take in our life is not grand, extraordinary, miraculous, daring, daring, you know, heroic acts of grandeur, but just ordinary obedience. Because ordinary obedience is what forms us most, just the habits, the things we do every day. You know, it's not the once-in-a-lifetime experiences that most shape us. It's what, the things we do every day, the ordinary habits that actually rewire our neural pathways, that sustain us when life gets hard, that lead to a life that lasts. And that's why Paul says in his letters, you know, Galatians, do not be deceived. God cannot be mocked. A, a man reaps what he sows. Whoever sows to please their flesh, and flesh for Paul means that part of us that's in rebellion to God. Um, you know, whoever reaps from that flesh will reap destruction. Whoever sows will reap destruction. But whoever sows to the Spirit from the Spirit will reap eternal life. Let's, so let's not become weary in doing good, for at the proper time we'll receive a harvest. Now notice that Paul doesn't say, whoever has an extraordinary experience with the Spirit will reap eternal life. Whoever performs great miracles by the Spirit will inherit eternal life. Whoever changes the world by the Spirit will reap eternal life. Whoever lives like a true, radical zealot will inherit eternal life. No, here's how he defines sowing to the Spirit. Carry each other's burdens. Carry your own load as well. Love your neighbor. You know, if you look at the end of other other letters, he says says in Ephesians, you know, tell the truth. Don't steal. Put your hands to work. Share with others. Don't talk trash about people. Make music in your heart to the Lord. Be kind. Be compassionate. You know, don't get drunk on wine and get debaucherous. Be filled with the Spirit. Make music in your heart to the Lord. Love your wife. Love your husband. Obey your parents. Raise your kids. Encourage them well. You know, don't exasperate them. Respect your boss. Treat your employees like you would Jesus. God cannot be mocked. Whoever sows to please the Spirit from the Spirit will reap a life that lasts forever. Because our eternal lives are shaped by ordinary habits, not extraordinary highlights. Our lives... Our present lives that will last for eternity are shaped by our present habits, not as much the extraordinary highlight. But where would Paul have gotten this crazy idea that ordinary, everyday obedience just leads to a life that lasts forever? Well, I think he he probably got it from Jesus, who said things like, You know, whoever can be trusted with very little can be trusted with much. If you haven't been trustworthy with worldly riches, who would trust you with true riches? Or things like, you know, come, you who are blessed by my Father. Take your inheritance, the kingdom prepared for you since the creation of the world. For I was hungry and you gave me something to eat. I was thirsty, I was naked, I was in prison. You just just did the little things little things to the little people the insignificant things now where would jesus have gotten crazy ideas like that that ordinary everyday little things little acts of good goodness and obedience that they they lead to a life that lasts eternally where would jesus have gotten that idea well from the old testament you know like we have an entire book of proverbs that 
say things like, truly the righteous attain eternal life, or attain life, but whoever pursues evil finds death. You see, as we look through the pages of Scripture, we find that God is very concerned and cares much about the ordinary, everyday, mundane choices we make. God just seems to be a big fan of wisdom and just common sense. And you might say, well, you know, isn't, isn't God, but isn't God just about grace? I mean, aren't we just simply saved by believing in him? Well, yes and no. When we surrender to Jesus, God puts to death our old lives and raises us to new, anew with resurrection life. He, he fills us with his spirit. He graciously and freely gives us the same spirit that lived in Jesus. Why? So that we can... Not so that we can, you know, just do whatever we want and get away with it. God puts his spirit in us so we can stop doing stupid stuff. Things that lead to death. Things that destroy us. Things that wreck our lives. And also so that we can start doing ordinary, basic, good stuff that leads to a good life that lasts forever. You know, we're a culture that's addicted to, like, the quick fixes. You know, the, the, the miraculous interventions. And, you know, we do pray for intervention, for grace, for miracles, for surprises. But God is equally interested in just the everyday, ordinary stuff. And, you know, sometimes I'm asked by people inside and outside the church, like, can we meet, can we talk? Um, I, you know, I'm in a crisis. My marriage is, is in crisis. Um, it's, it's just, it's explosive. I think it might be over. Uh, can we talk? And I say, sure. And I ask, you know, tell me about your marriage. Um, do you do fun stuff together? Do you like each other? Do you talk about hard stuff? Do you work it out? No. Do you, are you growing together in your faith? No. Uh, have you, have you seen a counselor? Really? No. You know, and, and they say, well, I, I just don't know what to do. You know, love's gotten cold. I'm not sure we're, we're going to make it. And so, Pastor, is, is, there, is there like a book I could read that would fix this? And I have to say, no. You know, there's, there's not a book that will fix years of neglecting ordinary wisdom. Because as we said last week, more information does not fix us. We don't change by thinking about stuff. Now, there is a book that will instruct you in how to live differently, you know, and and how to change and be transformed, but it's mostly ordinary, everyday obedience, not more information that that leads us to a life that lasts. And I I think our culture is pretty well addicted to the quick fix, you know, the the last-ditch effort and the big comeback and but you know, the thing that's, that's truly heroic and ordinary these days, it's just somebody that gets up every day and just one foot in front of the other. I mean, that's pretty extraordinary nowadays. Just somebody that makes the simple choices day after day, year after year. And one of those people is uh, Eugene Peterson, who, um, you know, you may know, translated the Bible in his own words, a paraphrase, it, the message paraphrase of the Bible, it sold like tens of millions of copies. And he didn't even set out to do it. He just started trying to write scripture in his own words for himself. And he's got one of his earliest books. It's, it's called A Long Obedience in the Same Direction. That's how Peterson you know, described the Christian life. You know, he was a smart guy. He could have been a big shot, but he just moved, got into ministry, moved to a random place outside Baltimore and just started pastoring an ordinary church. Just put his head down and started trying to walk obediently. And you know, eventually, you may have known a couple years before he died, um, one of the biggest rock stars in the world showed up at his house and said, tell me about this extraordinary thing you've done. And it was just ordinary stuff. Because that's pretty extraordinary nowadays. You know, ordinary... Obedience, though, it's not just religious, spiritual stuff. I mean, ordinary obedience includes just learning to live life wisely. 
Um, and for me, personally, that means getting over this need to be extraordinary. Uh, one of my challenges in life is that I'm not so good at having fun. Um, and it's taken, like, counselors and spiritual directors to help me see that. Um, and one of my challenges in my marriage is I'm not that good at having fun. I take life too seriously. I, you know, I stress out about the meaning of life and where it's all headed. And, and it really wears out my wife. I mean, I, I, she says, why can't we just do ordinary stuff? Like, watch some football and listen to country music. It's always got to be something extraordinary and different and novel and and I had a revelation about this last, this time last year. I was talking to her about the meaning. I was talking about the meaning of life, I think, up here. And one of, the, one of you in the church, uh, Rob Huff, I don't know if he's here today. He, he came up afterwards, and I'd been talking about some kind of angsty feeling I'd been having. He came up, he's like, I just want to make sure, you know, it's, how are you doing? And I thought he was about to say, because I'm feeling it too. And I said, oh, yeah, you know, I've been working through some things. And, but how about you, Rob? And he said, oh, well, I'm great. It's like sun's shining outside in January. Bears are playing today. Playoffs. And they haven't played in the playoffs since my, my daughters have been alive. I mean, I, I, I'm great. And I had this epiphany. And I, and I thought, why, can't, why is it Rob can just enjoy simple things like football? And I can't stop thinking about the meaning of life long enough to enjoy football. Like, what is with that? Uh, and, and, and ever since that day, fo- watching football with my wife has become like a spiritual discipline for me. I j- no, no joke. I mean, it's been a spiritual discipline. Seriously. And, and taking my wife to country concerts I don't like is like a close second. I, I got a shirt. It doesn't have sleeves. <laughs> for Christmas. <laughs> oh, yeah. Because, and I, I didn't like this concert. I did not like this concert. <laughs> <laughs> because, honestly, for me, just, like, sitting and, like, submitting to a football game is, like, it just thwarts all my overambitious needs to do something extraordinary and different and important. It cures my lust for the extraordinary. But it's not just football. You know what else cures our lust for the extraordinary? Prayer. Now, I don't mean the action-packed type of prayer like we do at the end where we're praying for immediate results. I mean like sitting for long periods of time, talk quietly, just talking to God. Because if you haven't noticed, most of the time, like, prayer is not, like, a quick fix, like, you know, action plan. I mean, it's, it's, it's just quietness, being with God. I don't know what else cures our lust for the extraordinary. It's just serving the poor. And years ago, God just had to tell me, like, get involved with our Seeds of Hope stuff. And I was like, I, I don't want to do that. I, I, you know, I like to build things and fix things because, you know, if you, if you come and just pray with people at our food pantry some month, you're like, wow, there's... You know, I, I, I know, there's not really a quick fix here. There's not a solution. And actually, this is like becoming more of a crisis for me than anything because I don't know what to do. I just pray. You know what else it could fix it? It's being present with children. It cures our lust for the extraordinary, needing a big moment. You know, that's why we invite people to serve back there. It's not for the kids exclusively. It's, it's for you. Another thing that cures our lust for the extraordinary is going to a small group. It's, if you've been to one, you know that every week it's not fireworks. Some weeks it's just the mundane. You know, learning the way of forgiveness. Learning to love people you don't even like. You know, reading the Bible. Especially the dry bits. You know, it's consistently giving your money back to God as an offering just week after week. You know, we're, these are all part of doing church, and church is meant to be a cure for our lust for the extraordinary. I'm, I'm becoming convinced of this. It's meant to cure it. Church is not meant to be just a thrill ride one moment to the next. It doesn't exist just to give you a spiritual high. I mean, that'll happen from time to time. 
But church is not given to us just to blow our hair back all the time or just to give us warm fuzzies all the time, but to form us in Christ's likeness through the mundane repetition of just simple obedience to acts of mercy and confession and thanksgiving and generosity and getting hurt and having to learn to forgive. Yeah, and sometimes miracles. But you know, the, I mean, the great news of church is that, you know, being here, all you have to do is get with the flow. Like to walk at simple obedience, you don't even have to create it all yourself. You can just get with the flow of the traditions of the church. Just put yourself in the river. And so I would invite our band to come now. We'll spend some time in, in, in worship, and this is the part where we don't just take in information, but we just, we just practice it. We're going to get with the flow. And one of the questions I think God's been asking me um, this last year and, and is, like, are you willing to be just an ordinary Christian? Or do you need to be a big deal? Are you willing to be just simply obedient? And sometimes that's going to mean like scary, incredible tasks he gives us to do, but it you know, Jesus says, if you're faithful, it's small. Let's, let's start there. And I also feel like he's been asking me, to, you know, to, are you willing to be just an ordinary church vineyard? You know, are you willing to just do the ordinary stuff? Just the left foot, right foot of faith. And we've been dabbling in some of these church traditions, um, particularly at the upper room before our services. And one of my fears in bringing it into the main service is just that some of these traditions, I thought, you know, they might bore you a little bit. But I've noticed the last few years that, that the repetition is actually forming you a bit. Some of you, as it is me. I mean, it's actually transforming some of us. You know, it's doing something that once in a lifetime experiences can't do. So I just want to, so the band, I just want them to be in, play quietly. We're going to take a minute or two, silence, and then we're going to read the corporate confession together. This is a formational practice, and then we're going to sing a little, and then we're going to be silent, and then we're going to read the Eucharist prayers together, and then we're going to, we're going to participate in the meal Jesus gives, and we're going to sing, and we're going, to, we're, going to, we're going to notice each other, and we're going to be together, and we're going to be the body of Christ and be formed in him just through the little stuff. And we'll pray for miracles afterwards too. But it's this little stuff that we, we begin with that's most formative. So would you just, just bow your heads? Let's take a minute just to be quiet. Let's, let's pray together. One slide back there. Yeah. It begins with the most merciful God. Oh, there we go. Most merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed. By what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. 
we have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We are truly sorry and we humbly repent. For the sake of your son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us and forgive us that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your name. Amen. Well, may the God of all mercies cleanse you from your sin, remind you of your salvation, and form you evermore into the image of his Son, our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Let's sing together. What joy is found in communion with you, holding your beauty and knowing your truth and living a life that pleases your Responding with praises to all that you are. We sing, oh, how lovely is the King in all His glory, is the Christ who is holy, who are. What joy is found at the foot of your throne, bowing in reverence, giving thanks to the one, joining the angels, the heavenly throne. the saints unending song
down to seek only your face laying down my crown I've come to worship I've come to fall down to seek only I've come to fall down to seek only your face laying down my crown oh how lovely the King in all his glory the Christ love you made us for yourself and when we had sinned against you and become subject to evil and death you in your mercy sent your only son into the world for our salvation by the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary he became flesh and dwelt among us in obedience to your will he stretched out his arms upon the cross and offered himself once for all that by his suffering and death we might be saved by his resurrection he broke the bonds of death trampling hell and Satan under his feet. And as our great high priest, he ascended to your right hand in glory that we might come with confidence before your throne of grace. Let's sing that again. And how amazing is his love so unfailing, His grace that draws us near. Sing how lovely. And oh, how lovely is the King in all His glory, the Christ who is holy.
Jesus name. Remember how on the night you were betrayed, you took bread and you, when you'd given thanks, you broke it and you said, this is my body which is given for you. Eat this in remembrance of me. And so we eat in remembrance of you. We come to you to be fed this morning. And we remember how after supper you took the cup and you said, this is my blood. It's about to be poured out for you for the forgiveness of your sins. Drink in remembrance of me. So we proclaim to get together the mystery of our faith that Christ has died, Christ is risen, and Christ will come again. Invite our small group leaders to come and to serve. And Lord, we pray that you'd send your Holy Spirit upon these gifts, that they may be for us the body and blood of Christ, holy food and drink of new and unending life in him. Sanctify us also that we may faithfully receive this holy sacrament, that we may become your body, that you may dwell in us and we in you, and bring us with all your saints into the joy of your eternal kingdom, where we shall see you face to face. And now let's pray the prayer that Jesus himself gave us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Oh, Christ, our Passover has been sacrificed and given for us. So let's keep the feast.
and to set free those in chains and to darkness or to open blind eyes. We pray that you'd come the way you did through Jesus. Not through, not through our own, uh, Lord, eager 
lust for the extraordinary, but just out of simple obedience, we offer this time to you now and look and watch and wait for what you're doing, knowing that it's you who do the extraordinary work, not us. Lord, you are always doing extraordinary things, and so we just offer you ourselves now as servants. As we gathered before the service, uh, some of our bread team leaders said that just God God, things he wanted to do, and if there's a few more of you guys who are part of the prayer ministry team, please come. Um, there's uh, somebody here by the name Angela, or just Angel, um, who's uh, God's calling to just come uh, step out just into his marvelous light, out of darkness into light. If that's you, I would invite you to come as others leave today. Um, if somebody who's uh, pers- you've got persistent headaches, um, you may feel that right now, I would invite you to come and receive uh, prayer for healing. Um, if you're battling depression right now, we want to pray for that. Or just brokenheartedness, uh, we want to pray for that this morning, uh, that you'd be set free. Uh, somebody with, with uh, like a broken bone. Uh, I know we've got at least one on the other side of the wall here, uh, child. Let's pray for that. We, prayer team believe God wants to bring healing today. Um, so, somebody, a daughter here who's having challenges with a parent, so just difficult relationships. Um, Somebody that's just feeling like, you know, just you might feel like a raging, like explosiveness inside uh, right now. What a play. That's, that's going on for you. Um, also, just um, uh, somebody had a picture of like a, just a large rainbow tree and waterfall and fly fishing. So I don't know what that means, but sometimes God connects the dots for us and just calls to us through different things that specifically connect with with us and our stories. So any of those things, if, if those resonate with you at all, just please come and let us pray that God does some, ex, something extraordinary through our ordinary prayers. We often see God just do things, just surprise us with power and miracles. So would you come as others go? And I want to pray for the rest of you. You can come right now. And for the rest of you, I, I pray, Lord, that you would take us out of here today with confidence that you yourself have called us um, that you are working through our ordinary, simple acts of obedience. Lord, and that you have the very best life in store for us. Uh, that we don't have to go chasing life on our own, uh, chasing fantasies, chasing grand you know, exploits and extraordinary, daring heroics. We don't have to go chasing that. We can just follow you. Would you take us out of here with that confidence and hope today living in us? We pray that in Jesus' name. Amen. For the fears of this world, there is hope renewed.